Thank you very much, Dora, for agreeing to give a Build a Soul seminar. And you can get started. Great, thank you for the invite. So um, just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Dora Tang. I'm just trying to work out where my laser is right now. Uh, I think I need to find my pointer because I have to agree to, there we go. Um, I'm gonna have to do this in a different way. I'm sorry about this. Got it. Right, better. Right, we're in action now. Okay, great. So thank you for the invitation to take part um, in the Build a Cell seminar. So just a quick introduction. Um, I'm a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. My PhD was in London at Imperial College where I worked in membrane biophysics. And then I did a postdoc in the University of Bristol um, with Stephen Mann. And the first part was in the origin of life. So we started thinking about how we could self-assemble mineral systems. And then I moved into more engineering approaches in synthetic biology. And so now um, in this Max Planck Institute, I'm interested in how we can interface some of these bottom-up approaches to biological systems. And really, I mean, with this audience, I'm sure that we're all aware that one of the goals of building cells from the bottom up um, is to build or reconstitute life from scratch with the motivation that if you can build life, then you can understand how it works. And so within this context, what I find particularly interesting about living systems is that they're a collection of self-assembled molecules which can support all of life processes. And so we know the molecules that make up the cell, but if we took all of the molecules the lipids, proteins, sugars, and DNA, and mix them into a pot, we'd be far from recreating anything that might resemble life. But what would we define as the criteria for life? So the biological cell is the basic unit of life. And when we look at the cell, we know that compartmentalization is a key biological feature. And so we have an electron micrograph here on the left, and it shows us different compartments in the cells. And we know that these different compartments, such as the ER, the nucleus, mitochondria, and lysozyme, have different physical features. So for, examples, for example, the cell membrane is largely impermeable. And this has the ability to separate the inner contents from the external environment. I just have this little cartoon here. We also know that there are compartments with permeability, such as the nucleus which can allow the diffusion of small molecules, but the retention of larger molecules. And um, there's a lot of interest these days in membrane-free compartments, such as pea granules and stress granules. You can see that all of these have slightly different physical features. We also know that these compartments are critical for containing and segregating molecular reactions. And these compartmentalized reaction networks can communicate and signal and respond to each other to impart robust outcomes that are critical for biological life. And lastly, these features together provide the ability to sustain out of equilibrium behavior, which Schrodinger defined as a fundamental property of living systems. So what we know is that reactions on their own can drive out of equilibrium behavior, but we're still very far from understanding how compartments can affect these reactions, or indeed, if these compartments are coordinated in space and time, how this can affect an overall out of equilibrium behavior. And this really comes from um, the, his the history of enzymology where most of our understanding of enzyme kinetics come from purifying protein and assaying them in buffer. But this doesn't take into account the physical environment of cellular compartmentalization. And so getting to the heart of how compartments can tune reactions it's not only critical for building life from scratch, but it also provides an understanding of how compartmentalization could have been important during the origin of life. It's key to understanding the ordered molecular processes of modern biological systems, and it provides us a way to engineering living systems with an increased efficacy, a life 2.0. So what is our approach to building life from scratch? So my lab aims to build minimal systems which can support out of equilibrium behavior with these features of reactions, compartments, and communication. 
And we do this using a bottom-up synthetic biology approach. So here we self-assemble molecules into synthetic cells. And these synthetic cells are micron-sized compartments which can contain reactions. And these compartments can communicate by molecular diffusion to coordinate the cells within a population. And actually, for us to be able to understand how reactions are tuned by compartments provide us a rational way into how we can design and build higher order structures which can support out of equilibrium behavior. And so what we've done towards the goal of addressing how reactions are tuned by compartments is to build a synthetic cell toolkit. And effectively, the synthetic cell toolkit contains compartments of different physical properties and reactions of different flavors. And just to give you an overall summary of some of the compartments that we work with. So we have mimics of um, impermeable membranes, and these are typically based on lipids, which we know can self-assemble um, in water to generate lipid vesicles. These are not entirely impermeable, but provide quite a large barrier to um, quite a large number of molecules. We work with protein polymer conjugates, which are chemically cross-linked. Maybe I, oh, I missed um, some of the slides on this. Anyway, so protein polymer conjugates, um, which are, are amphiphytic molecules where we have proteins conjugated to polymers, and these are chemically cross-linked to generate um, a system where we have um, porosity, where large molecules are encapsulated inside and uh, small molecules can diffuse in and out. And then the last system that we um, work with compiled are membrane-free coacivates, which are formed via um, coacivation of oppositely charged polymers. We can generate these quite reproducibly in the lab, and I'll talk about each of these systems in a little bit more detail throughout the talk. But what we've really contributed um, to the field are the generation of hybrid compartments, which have features of both membrane-free compartmentalization and membrane-bound compartmentalization. Within our synthetic cell toolkit, we have a range of different reactions um, from primitive RNA reactions to metabolic reactions that come from biology, cell-free transcription and translation, um, where we take DNA, convert it to mRNA and protein in a test tube, and more programmable type of reactions based on DNA. And the reason why we have um, a synthetic cell toolkit such as this, it allows us the ability to plug and play. Um, it also gives us a high molecular control over the system, so we can change the system on the molecular level and work out how this might be changing the overall properties of the system and its effect on the enzyme reaction. And depending on the question we're interested in, it gives us an ability to pick the most ideal system for the question at hand. So, for example, if we're thinking about origin of life questions, the membrane-free coacivates with the primitive RNA reactions are the most suitable. And so what we've been trying to establish over the last few years is a high control over the formation of these compartments um, with their reactions inside. And this is really important because if we want to start probing how compartments are affected by enzymes and vice versa, it's important for us to have a high control of the volume of the compartments as well as knowing the concentrations inside. And this actually gives us the ability to be able to quantify um, reaction rates within the compartments. I just want to show you one example um, of how we've managed to achieve this um, over the last few years. So focusing back into cell-free gene expression, where effectively you have kind of all the minimal components that you might need for transcription and translation in the test tube. You can add in your DNA template and your energy solution. And what we've um, kind of modified into the system was generate, and this is something that's um, well established in the field is generated plasmid where we can have a dual reporter system where we can detect the mRNA via aptima, which binds to a fluorescent molecule. So when the mRNA is formed, we can get a fluorescence output. And then um, via the protein, which is also fluorescent, but on a different channel. We encapsulate these in uh, microfluidic devices, and this is work from David in the lab. And um, he incorporates these into water oil emulsions through the microfluidic device, which can generate in the end water water systems, where your membrane here is a lipid bilayer and encapsulated inside is a self-free expression system with our DNA coding for our dual reporters. 
And we can see under the microscope using these microfluidic methods that we can generate um, lipid vesicles of very high reproducibility. So this channel here is showing the fluorophore from the dye that's embedded into the lipid vesicle, into the membrane. We have the mRNA channel here. We can see an increase in green fluorescence as mRNA is being produced. And in this channel here, you can see a delayed onset of the protein expression um, from the um, transcription, translation of the mRNA into the protein. And so from here, it gives us the ability to actually um, control the amount of DNA that we have in our um, lipid vesicles, and we can generate mixed populations of lipid vesicles with different DNA concentrations. And from here, you can see from this pool of um, lipid vesicles that we actually have three different DNA concentrations, and then resulting three different mRNA concentrations and three different um, protein concentrations, and we can actually ex extract these from the population behavior. Because we can quantify the, con um, the concentration of mRNA and mCherry gives us the ability then to start extracting and um, the kinetic um, parameters for transcription and translation based on cell-free systems. And this work is published, so I um, won't go into the exact details here. So we wanted to kind of use this kind of control to begin to pull out general principles of how compartments are affecting reactions. And I just want to move on now to our membrane-free quasivates and how these membrane-free environments um, can tune reactions. And so quasivates literally mean to come together and describe the coming together of two oppositely charged polyelectrolytes in solution. And here they're attracted by an electrostatic interaction. And there's an entropic drive from the release of water um, and counter ions from around the polymer chains. What effectively happens is you generate these um, highly charged and polymeric droplets in the center with no membrane on the outside. And these are really interesting because they form from a wide variety of different molecules. This here is just one little fragment of the types of molecules that will form coacivates. They can see that it becomes possible that by changing the chemical um, that is forming the coacivate, that you might change the overall um, emergent properties of the coacivate, such as viscosity, and they begin to understand how this might affect enzyme reactions. And so these coacivate droplets are not things that we've discovered. In fact, most of the systems that we're working in our toolkit have been established by other labs and we've just compiled them together. And De Jong was a Dutch chemist in the Netherlands who started to work with these colloidal systems in the 1920s. And he was actually the guy that coined the word conservation to describe the phase um, properties or the phase separation properties of polyelectrolytes in solution. And since then, they've been used pretty extensively in industry um, for encapsulation of flavors, but also for extraction. So to pull out uh, molecules within these coacivate phases. Around the same time that De Jong was active, Oprin was a Russian scientist who conjectured that these coacivate droplets might have been important in the origin of life to bring together organic molecules to generate a heterogeneous environment that's distinct from its outer solution. And this would have been an important reaction site to kickstart the first reactions on Earth. And um, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of interest and a growing acknowledgement that coacivation is a physical phenomena, which is part of the mechanism that is driving the phase separation um, of these membrane-free organelles within um, biological systems. And so for us, we use them as a synthetic system to try and address and understand how they might tune reactions. And so when we take these oppositely charged components and we mix them in the lab, they form a turbid solution. And when we look at that under the microscope, we see these membrane-free compartments or membrane-free droplets. They have the ability to coalesce. So um, they'll kind of come together, merge, and they will. this will typically happen. They'll keep continually merging and merging until you form a giant macromolecular phase. And as indicated by their applications in industry, that they have this ability to up-concentrate. So this image here on the right shows a dispersion of coacivate droplets. And we've put in fluorophores, and you can see they've all been sucked up inside. And then you can imagine that, you know, to encapsulate flavors, this is quite cool because you can put the flavors inside the coacivates and they will suddenly burst. 
But in terms of enzyme reactions, this ability to upconcentrate can um, potentially increase rates of reaction. And so when we take a dehydrogenase reaction, so this is one of the reactions from our toolkit, and incubate this in a dispersion of coacivate droplets, we do indeed see an increase in the rate of reaction in the coacivate compared to the buffer. And this on a primary face value, we attribute to the upconcentration effect. But as a caveat, there could be effects here from um, changing the enzyme structure, for example. But if we take a completely different reaction, so in this case, we take a ribozyme, which has, um, which is basically very primitive. So it's the, has a length of a 29 mil, which means that it can be quite floppy. Um, and this ribozyme combined a substrate RNA and cut it into two. And when we take exactly the same concentration of the ribozyme and the substrate in the buffer, as compared to in the coacivate, we see that it's quite distinctive that the rate of reaction is much, much slower in the class of eight compared to in the buffer solution. And what we saw with these data when we analyzed the structure of the RNA in the class of eight, that actually the, within the class of eight, the RNA structure is deforming. And this is actually leading to this decrease in the rate of reaction. And so what we can tell from using different reactions from our toolkit is that, um, we can begin to investigate effects that are non-obvious. So here we see that it's not always the case that rates of reaction will be sped up and not always the case that reactions will be slowed down. And there can be other effects um, that take place because we have a membrane-free environment. And so using microfluidics as well with the lab of Jean-Christophe Barry, we simulated kind of a hybrid cell which has um, an internalized coacivate droplet that's surrounded by an outer aqueous medium of finite volume. And here on the right, you can see that we have individual coacivate droplets within an aqueous environment. And this is an impermeable membrane because here we have a surfactant that is in, um, in tandem with an oil phase on the outside. So we don't get any diffusion of molecules through this interface. Just want to skip this slide. So when we put um, an enzyme reaction um, into the um, hybrid system, we can actually generate or characterize the kinetics um, in each of the different regions in the coacivate droplet, in this aqueous region outside of the aqueous droplet, by squeezing the cells through a channel where we have a laser focus. So you can kind of get spatial resolution here. And what we saw here is when we extracted the initial rates was something very interesting. So we have increased rates of reaction in the hybrid system. So this is in the coacivate droplet and in this outer region, aqueous region outside of that droplet. And what we do is we compare the rates of reaction to a system where the coacivate is completely separate from the buffer. And so you have just the coacivate phase alone and just the buffer phase alone. So the difference is, is that is uncoupled. In this system, we have this interface of the coacivate droplet that's coupled to an outer aqueous region. And because we can measure and quantify the amount of um, enzymes and substrates in each of the different phases by fluorescence, then we can actually compare um, the two systems. So the coacivate here will have the same concentration as what we expect in this droplet here, and the equivalent in the outer solution to the individual buffer phase. And when we do this, like I say, we see higher rates of reaction in both these two phases compared to what's happening in the individual phase, in the individual um, crossfade and in the buffer. So what we propose is happening here is that um, we know that the reaction will be up concentrated into the droplet and it will support the enzyme reaction here. So the molecules are being turned over and you're producing the product. Because the product can diffuse through the over the interface of the coacivate droplet, then this will give you an apparent increase in product in this outer solution here, compared to what we see when we don't have the system coupled. And because in this case, our enzyme is product inhibited, we don't get an accumulation of product within the system, within the coacivate, and this actually um, allows you to keep producing product 
within this droplet phase and thus giving us an increase in the rate of reaction in the class of eight. So it's an indication that actually without any membrane and having the ability for the product to diffuse across the interface can help to relieve product inhibition and actually increase the rates within the droplet and give us an apparent increase in the product in this outer aqueous phase here. And so we wanted to see whether this could be a general, um, a universal mechanism. And so we can go back to our toolkit and take a completely different type of um, synthetic cell. So here we can take a, the protein polymer conjugates, and I'll tell you exactly how we make these um, in the next slide. And these are the permeable systems where we can retain large molecules, um, but allow the diffusion of small molecules in and out of the interface. And we use here a DNA-based reaction, um, which uh, uses three enzymes, the polymerase, exonuclease, and nicase. So this proteinosome is made from a protein polymer conjugate, which means that the polymer is hydrophobic and the protein is hydrophilic. And then you mix this into a water oil emulsion and it generates a pickering emulsion and we can chemically cross-link. So we can chemically cross-link the protein polymer conjugates. And this effectively generates something like a bead on a string system where the beads are the protein polymer conjugate and you have a chemical cross-link, which are your linkages between the beads. But imagine this being a 3D structure. Um, and because we can remove the oil, it basically means you can generate a water oil, an oil, a water water system with water on the inside and water on the outside. So when we encapsulated this reaction, um, the pen DNA reaction, into um, the proteinosomes, and we effectively increased the total number of proteinosomes and compared how the rate was affected by this compared to in the buffer solution. So what we see is that in the proteinosome, there's almost a tenfold increase in the rate um, as we increase the template concentration compared to what we see in the buffer. And what we think is happening here is exactly the same thing that we saw in the class rate system on a completely different physical system where your reaction is encapsulated and then the DNA or the product can diffuse out and this stops the um, reaction becoming inhibited. And this actually allows you to keep increasing the amount of the um, product formation, um, keep shunting it towards the product because you're relieving the product inhibition there. So what I've hope I've been able to um, show you so far is how we can use compartments with different physical properties to try to deconvolute how compartments can tune reactions. And so, for example, what um, I've been able to show you is that the physical chemical environment of membrane-free coacivates can both slow down reactions, but also can speed reactions up. We've also seen that if it's um, the molecules can diffuse freely through a membrane, this can actually have an effect of increasing rates of reaction, which we think is happening by the relief of um, product inhibition um, in the compartment. Other things that we've shown using our toolkit is that um, we can generate dynamic behaviors within classmates and we can switch behaviors on um, by generating a compartment in situ. And we've also been able to show with these membrane-free compartments that they can grow and divide and select. And this was a nice collaboration with Dieter Brown's lab in Munich. So having started to be able to deconvolute how compartments are affected by reactions, how can we use this knowledge and information to be able to start thinking about building higher order structures? Um, as I demonstrated or described to you that we could do by using our synthetic cells to drive communication by molecular diffusion. And this has the ability to coordinate the cells in the population. And in the last part of the talk, I will tell you about how we plan to design um, population of cells which can support out of equilibrium behavior. And this really goes back to our original premise where we can have reactions, compartments, and communication. And effectively, we can have reactions of different flavors. If we compartmentalize these different reactions, um, then we can generate effectively nodes and we can connect these nodes 
by communication, by the diffusion of different molecules to generate different types of outer equilibrium behavior. And one of kind of, I guess, a primitive example is an oscillation. So to generate an oscillation with three nodes, you can do this by combining autocatalysis, a linear reaction, and an inhibitory reaction. And so thinking about how we can design the type of system is a system where we would want to have a compartment where reactions are contained within there, but you get the free diffusion of um, products um, and substrates um, across the interface that can be shared between the different nodes. And so we can go to our toolkit and think about what's the best system for this. And actually the kind of a nice example that we have is to take the permeable membrane, which is the protein polymer conjugates that we call proteinosomes, and combine this with um, a pen DNA reaction. And so these pen DNA reactions are not, again, not systems that we've developed in our lab. Um, they're developed by um, a French uh, scientist in Paris, Yannick Brondelais. And they're pretty cool because um, they're based on the DNA programming. So you have a DNA template, a primer, three enzymes, a polymerase, an exonuclease, and nickase, and energy, which can drive the reaction. And so effectively what happens in the system is that um, you have a DNA template, which has been programmed to bind onto a primer. So the primer will bind, which is what we have here as A, will bind onto the template strand, and then the polymerase will extend that DNA strand across um, the template. There's a recognition site for a nickase to cut the DNA, and then depending on its binding constant, this can be released into the solution. And then there's an exonuclease which can drive the degradation of any primer strands that are in solution. And so depending on what the template strand is actually gives you ability to program different types of reactions. So here, if the first half is the same as the second half on the template strand, you generate two primer strands that are the same from having one, that's an autocatalytic reaction. And in the same way that if you have a different strand, this can be programmed to be an inhibitor for um, another type of reaction, or it can just be a linear reaction that is just released and could connect to a different reaction. So from here, we can produce autocatalysis, linear reactions, and inhibitory reactions. I've already told you how we make the proteinosomes. And so we can encapsulate effectively the template DNA within the proteinosomes. And um, we add in the three enzymes and the primer strand from the outside. And because the pores are so big, that everything will just diffuse in, but the template strand is bound in there. So this is how we basically encapsulate the reaction, but everything else is diffusing in and out of the membrane. And so when Adrian, um, the postdoc, um, set the system up, we started first of all with the autocatalytic template, and we have a fluorescent molecule which binds to double-stranded DNA. So we can detect the production of double-stranded DNA within the proteinosome. And so we can image these droplets over time. And when we extract the kinetics for individual droplets, we can actually um, see that this is a profile that's, that's kind of synonymous of autocatalysis. And this is kind of telling us in some ways that our um, design principle is working, that we can encapsulate that DNA strand and we can run a reaction in the center. But what about being able to drive communication, which is an important step of building these population systems. And so here we generated two populations of proteinosomes. One contains the autocatalytic reaction, which I just showed you on the previous slide. And the second um, is programmed to have a linear reaction. And effectively we have one primer strand, which will turn on the linear reaction and it produces a different product, which becomes a substrate for the autocatalytic reaction. We can label our proteinosomes so we can see that we have two different populations of proteinosomes, one in purple and one in red. And when we detect the fluorescence output in each of the individual proteinosomes, what we see is this blue profile here is the, uh, or the fluorescence output from the linear reaction. And the um, red profile here is the fluorescence output from the autocatalysis. 
and can see that there's a slight delay in the autocatalytic reaction, which um, we think is being driven by the formation of um, the product from population one, which is a substrate for population two. Our control experiment where we completely remove population one um, proteinosomes and add in the primer that will kickstart the linear reaction here, we see no um, autofluorescence or no fluorescence from the autocatalytic reaction from this red profile. This gray line is just the background control of the background fluorescence in the system. So what um, this is giving us an indication that it does become possible for us to um, start building these higher level populations where we have reactions that are encapsulated into compartments and these generate these individual nodes which we can connect by communication and we hope to be making some progress into generating oscillatory behaviors. So in summary, what we are interested in the lab um, is trying to understand how molecules can organize themselves in time and space to support dynamic life processes. And we, to do this, we use bottom-up approaches to build synthetic cellular systems that can sustain out of equilibrium behavior. And so we've been using our synthetic cell toolkit to help us to define how compartmentalization can tune reactions. And this is an important foundation to be able to build out of equilibrium behavior across populations and also a rational way for us to be able to control these systems from the molecular level. And so our work, we hope, can contribute to some of the questions in the origin of life we're using our systems to interface um, to biological questions um, that we hope can inform biological systems. And we hope in the future to be able to be, be able to engineer our systems so we get enhanced activities that are beyond what we might see in biological systems. And so finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, my lab. Um, these systems. They look very nice on the images, but they're not so easy to make. And I think one of the big challenges for us has been able to get reproducibility so that we can actually start getting to quantification of um, our systems. And so for the work that I showed you, uh, Bjorn um, kind of drove the RNA project in the classmates, and this was in collaboration with Hannes Muschler. Um, Selena was doing the work with the hybrid systems. Um, in collaboration with Thomas Benetton, our um, microfluidics uh, collaborators, Adrian really drove the pen DNA work with the proteinosomes, and now this is being followed up by Giorgio and Meng Fei. And David was kind of really been setting up our cell free expression systems in our lipid vesicles. Um, I'd like to finally thank our collaborators and you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. There are some questions in chat. Can you see chat? Yeah, I can. If you could read, if you could yeah. please read a question before answering, that's going to go for the recording. Sure. So Ava Martin says, does the rate increase in coassivates depend on type of coassivate or does it work regardless of what kind of protein the coassivate is made on? Um, so what we understand so far is that the chemistry of coassivate can affect the rates. We've never seen something so dramatic that in one protein system, we can tune the chemistry that we can cause a reaction to switch on, or go faster or go slower. But it may be the case because um, it will depend on the enzyme system. Uh, so that could be a possibility. Does that answer the question for this one? It's, it's dependent on the chemistry of the coassivate. Yes, but it um, but also protein different proteins will behave differently in the class of eight. I don't know whether that's answered the question or not. Um, you can follow up on the chat. So the next question is from Stefan Durkel. Do you think the compartment reaction effects would be the same if compartmentalization is achieved in a more prebiotic way, like by mineral surfaces? Or does it have to be on its compartment with lumen like a liposome or coassivate only? Um, no, I don't think that it has to be a lumen. Just to clarify, um, in coassivates, they don't have a lumen. So they're kind of 
chemically enriched in the center is in like their polymeric. So it's not that you have a membrane and then a lumen inside. But I do think that um, you can also see acceleration of rates and that may not be driven by a compartment. I think compartment can be one way to do it. Um, I think something that's important to consider is that all of this work is done in enzyme reactions, which may behave differently to chemical prebiotic reactions. Um, so that's something that I think needs to be considered. Um, from Peter Mandel, he says, could you speculate if life always has to be compartmentalized or would it be possible to do bulk reactions that are still out of their equilibrium? Um, I think compartmentalization gives you some advantages in that, um, like I demonstrated the nodal system, you can separate out different reactions and then you can have different um, possibilities. That if you have everything in bulk, then you can't get the separation or segregation. And I think this is why it happens in biology um, because some reactions are more suited in some compartments, but being able to communicate between different compartments gives you an advantage rather than having everything mixed up. Um, whether it always had to be compartmentalized, um, like I say, I think it has some advantages we see from modern biology that compartmentalization is there. So at some point it must have had some evolutionary advantage. But it's not to say that at the beginning, reactions would have not happened without, like it can be that reactions will happen in compartments. Maybe when you reach a certain complexity, compartments become useful. Hmm. Chris Dunnett, what's the difference between a clasphate and a proteinosome? Um, so a clasphate is, um, is a membrane-free compartment. Um, what I imagine this to be like is when we overcook spaghetti and all the spaghetti entangles together. Um, so your, it's like a polymer chain, you generate the ball and you have some sort of interface, but there's no sort of distinct membrane. Proteinosome, I think the analogy is like a T sieve where you have like, um, I don't know whether you know, like the sphere of the tea and you put your tea leaves inside and there's holes. Um, and this is membrane bound. They're made from completely different building blocks. Their self-assembly processes are different. So coacivates come from um, electrostatic interactions um, and entropic drive from the rearrangement of water and charge and counter ions. Proteinosomes form via a picking and emulsion system where you have an amphiphilic um, molecule which sits on a water oil interface. Um, I hope that answers it. Okay. Okay, next question from Daniel Keeland. Could you talk about the size of the compartment? Do larger or smaller vesicles, for example, have an effect on the exome? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so this is also comes back, I think, in part to the prebiotic compartmentalization question. So there are a number of different effects in which compartments can affect reactions. So all compartments will have a bulk interior if it's if it's at a certain size and also an interface. So that interface could be a membrane, like in a lipid vesicle or proteinosome, or it can be like in the case of the class of eight where there's some sort of interface with no membrane. And what I conjecture is that both in the bulk phase and on the interface, you'll have different effects. And so if these are strong, then yes, having a larger or smaller vesicle will have an effect on the observed rates. But I don't think we have anything to prove that hypothesis, but I think it physically makes sense. Yeah. Uh, from Oscar Stauffer. Um, I wonder how much the chemistry of the surfactant layer used to stabilize the water oil droplets affects the reaction rates by adsorbent rates. I think this is also coming to a similar question to the one previously that yes, the, um, the interface can make a difference. What I understand for the water oil emulsions is that this surfactant layer is quite inert, but we don't know exactly because different chemicals will have different absorption effects. And I, I think this will, um, I think surface effects will take into account. But again, like I said, we haven't looked into that entirely. Okay, from Brendan Mortage. 
Do you have any experience with crossfates that sequester nucleic acids like RGG or other similar domains that stick to nucleic acids? Could they help with the, for example, ribozyme reactions? Yes, we have sequestered different RNA. Um, we did this in collaboration with um, Barbara Troitland's lab, which is a single cell sequencing lab. And effectively, we actually here, it was less of a model system, but we took total RNA um, from cells and sequestered these into droplets of different chemistries. So the class of eight droplets, some were entirely protein droplets and some were our synthetic polymeric, polymeric, polymeric class of eights. And here we do see that different chemistries of the cross weights do sequester um, different types of nucleic acid. I think as far as I remember that the consistent, um, it was RNA which had repeated motifs, which have the ability to double strand and or hairpin on themselves, that these were typically more likely to go into the cross weights. We don't know we haven't looked into systematically changing the peptide to see how that might have an effect, but we do see that um, different peptide systems are changing ribozyme activity. So work that we, we did in collaboration in one system where we took a ribozyme, which is a ligase and made crossovates with lysine these actually slow down the ribozyme, but a very similar ribozyme with polypeptides was also sped up. So what we seem to understand is that there's quite a wide range of ways that the class weights can change the ribozyme activity. And this is attributed to the stickiness, like you say, the ability to take in salt ions um, to fluidize or liquidize the compartment. So I think, um, I think a couple of those papers are out now, and we're also kind of putting one together. So that will hopefully come out in the next few months, but that will give you some information there. From Newt Avert, could you regulate reaction rates in vesicles by regulating permeability of the membrane, for example, with ion channels? Bring reagents and remove waste at different rates would affect rates, I presume. Thank you for the interesting presentation. So. Yes, so what I didn't show you with the lipid vesicle work is that we characterized the transcription translation rates when we had it in lipid vesicles compared to when we had it in buffer solution. And what we saw in that system is that um, because there's a little bit of leakiness from the lipid vesicle that this actually reduced the rate in the lipid compared to, the, compared to when you just had it in buffer. And we've got several controls to prove them. What we think was happening is that nutrients were diffusing through. So yes, these kind of effects will make a difference. Um, a thing about having channels as well, which is quite useful, is that you can keep pumping nutrients in and also, like you say, removing waste. Um, but it's difficult to, I think, in our synthetic systems to do that controllably. You sort of have kind of with kind of protein pores, just bigger holes that things can come in and out. With ion channels, I don't know how controllable they are within the membrane and synthetic systems, but if you could want to put in a specific ion, um, that could be useful. Um, I hope that answered the questions. I just ran through that very quickly. But if anyone wants to follow up, you can also type in here, I have a few more minutes. I, I think these are all the questions. I, I'm actually really happy that someone asked the question that I was embarrassed to ask because I wasn't clear what's the difference between Classervat and Prodenosome is either. Um, sorry, I didn't <laughs> explain it so well. It, and it's actually one of, half of my, one of half of my slides is missing. So I apologize for that. But I, I normally explain. I, there's normally for it's like I know what a cluster but is, but I always thought prodenosome is just a fancy word for a cluster, but and I didn't know they're actually structurally different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They self-assemble yeah. in a completely different way as well. Um, very different physical properties. Um, one is covalently linked as well. So it's, once it's there, it's pretty robust. So the cluster we add a bit of salt and it disappears. So, 
this is super cool. I, if we have one minute, I, I would like to ask one more question myself. Um, do you have much experience with making compartments out of like inert polymers, things like some sort of a peg that you cross link? Um, I was mostly thinking, uh, especially when you were talking about interactions of cassavats with RNA, and we all know how difficult vesicles are to work with. I'm always tempted to look more into those completely inert things that you can like cross link with UV and you have a stable compartment mm. that just sits there. So we don't do that, but um, there are a lot of examples of sort of hydrogel droplets, right? That you can, yeah. um, that they say is sort of a cytoskeletal mimic. Yes. With PEG, with the chemistry of being able to cross link that, I don't know about the chemistry of that. I don't know how easy PEG would be to modify it so that you could UV chemically cross link it. But it, it depends what question you want to ask, right? So for us, yeah. we're just interested in general physical environments, but you know, I mean, PEG is also a bit of a funny molecule because it's also a bit yes. hydrophobic, a bit hydrophilic, it dehydrates, it's um, so that could be just an interesting molecule yeah. in general to have in a compartment because it does something, does some crazy stuff. Um, yeah. I think what you're thinking about is maybe these sort of hydrogel system. I have a little bit of experience with one type of hydrogels with a collaborator at UW and they're not, they look great on paper, but once you start working with them, you run into all those problems similar to liposomes. For example, how quickly do you polymerize them? How completely you polymerize them before all the other stuff in your reaction starts precipitating with, it's one of those things that I was excited to start doing. And now that we're actually doing it, I hate hydrogels. So I don't know yeah. if there is a perfect compartment. I, I think, anything that's soft matter is quite difficult to manipulate and I think you know it's coassivates are quite easy to make but they're quite difficult to characterize actually if you really want to kind of get to characterize in the system proteinosomes I haven't I mean now we spent quite a lot of effort to make them reproducible but so I think anything that is kind of soft matter lends to these yeah. difficulties I mean I know I worked with lipids in my PhD and it was yeah yeah someone spent a whole PhD before me making the systems reproducible yes they look gorgeous on, on pictures and but they're very finicky I think this is where you have to really acknowledge the students who are actually dealing with them in the lab because yes. they can come with a lot of frustration for sure. yes totally yeah. All right, if there are no more questions, I wanna say thank you so much again, Dora, for giving mm. a talk and thanks everyone for a discussion. Yeah, thank you for all the questions. That's really great. <laughs> and thanks for having me. And, and have a great, great week, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah.